Well, grace to you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon Hill? How are you doing today? And thanks for coming out uh, and worshiping with us. A big thanks to Mr. Rob Blackwell for coming up from New Bern, North Carolina to be here with us today. Rob will be back with us uh, a couple more times later in the month. Um, I'm thankful for his friendship and his partnership in the gospel. We go back a ways. I don't want to mention how long we go back, but he didn't have any facial hair when we met, and I didn't have a belly. So it's been a while. Um, it's been a minute. But I'm thankful for him, and I'm thankful that he's here with us today. If you're a guest with us today, uh, I hope you've been greeted warmly already by our Beacon Hill team. If I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, please stop by and say hello after service. I'll be down here uh, with some of our other staff. We'd love to get a chance to meet you and thank you personally for being here. Beacon Hill Church is an expository preaching, missional living church. Uh, we go through books of the Bible explaining the grand redemptive story of Jesus. And it's that Jesus I want to preach to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Open them up with me to Matthew chapter 3, where we'll be studying verses 1 through 12 this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand, and one of our Beacon Hill team members will bring you a copy of God's Word for you to have. If you don't have one at home, please take it with you as our gift to you this morning. If you're watching online, uh, welcome. We are so thankful to have people watching um, that couldn't make it to church, some people watching in Haiti, and uh, we'll be there in about a week to see you. We can't wait to be there uh, with you in Haiti. Uh, not so much for the plane ride, but I can't wait to be with you um, and be in there. And people in the Philippines and around the world that are watching, um, we have tens of viewers online. All right, right now, if you're able, I invite you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. Huge, got a huge following. All right. Matthew 3, 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. The chaff he will burn will fire that never goes out. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you just to be able to be here today. Lord, I thank you for the sweet sounds of, of our congregation just worshiping you. Lord, that, that's the word for the year, worship. Maybe worship you not just in this hour, but throughout the week and every hour and minute and second of our lives. May we worship you. Our worship should be a hallelujah from head to toe. And Lord, as I prepare to proclaim your word this morning, Lord, may people hear your word being spoken through me. Lord, I'm just a, I'm just a, a broken man who has been being put back together only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, may we make much of you today. Lord, I pray that if someone is in here today that, that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I've had so much brokenness in my life in the last month, so many people that have gone on who have died for senseless reasons and things that don't make sense. Lord, I'm, I'm tired of acting like we have forever. Your word says today is the day of salvation because we don't know what tomorrow brings. So, Lord, for the believers in this room, may they take heart to this message. May they not get comfortable in their Christianity. But may they 
clear their own paths in their lives that are being roadblocks currently from other people seeing you. Lord, may I decrease now and you increase and you get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I, I've entitled this message simply, From Good to Great. From Good to Great. There, uh, when I was in seminary, there was a lot of classes. Man, we always had lots of books to read. And if you know anything about me, I will give you lots of books to read because I believe that um, leaders are readers, and you need to, to read as much and absorb as much, not just things that you like, but you need to have a broad scope of what you're learning and taking in. And one of the books that kept me in mention in seminary class was this book by Jim Collins called From Good to Great. And it was interesting that it was mentioned in so many seminary classes because it, it wasn't a Christian book. It was a secular book. And so after hearing it in class after class, I finally decided to pick up a copy of it and read it. And I would highly recommend you read it as well. But really, the premise of the book is that the enemy of great is good. Let me say that again. The enemy of great is good. As long as you and I are content with being good, we will never be great. But I don't think God has called us, has called Beacon Hill to be another good church. I believe God has called us to do great things for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. Are you with me this morning? So I don't want us to slide into contentment. I want us to continue pushing ourselves, and our number one plumb line is to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I want us to continue to grow, one, in our personal lives as a church, as we continue to shine the light of Christ into this broken community. So I believe God has called us to do great things, not so people will praise Beacon Hill, but so that people will praise his holy name. So let me ask you a question this morning. Do you want to be good for God, or do you want to be great for the glory of God? Do you want to be good for God, or do you want to be great for the glory of God? Because Corey Ten Boom puts it simply like this. Expect great things from God. We all do, don't we? Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. That is really what we're talking about this morning, is about being great for the glory of God. When we get into Matthew chapter 3, we have been studying Matthew chapter 1 and 2, and there's like a timeline difference between chapter 2 and chapter 3. And if you like to write in your Bible, you can put pretty much 30 years, 30 years time hop between chapters 2 and chapter 3. And in the first verse of chapter 3, we were introduced to a man called John the Baptist. And we're going to talk a, a lot about him, but let me share what Jesus said about him. Because I could tell you all about him, but it's what Jesus says about him that's most important, isn't it? And Jesus says in Matthew 11, 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. Did you catch that? That up until that point, there had been no one greater than John the Baptist who had been born. Think about the significance of that statement that Jesus made. That is a high bar, church. Greater than Abraham. Greater than Isaac. Greater than Jacob. Greater than no Moses. Greater than Elijah. Greater than Noah. Greater than David. No one greater had been born. Not kings, emperors, political leaders. No one has been born that was greater at this moment in time. So you must think he's got to come from a famous family, don't you? You got to think that he must be wealthy or he must be a prominent athlete because that's what Americans considers with greatness. But when you look at the life of John the Baptist, you would have to say nope to all of that. In fact, his dad was someone who took turns ministering at the temple when it was his turn to serve on the Sunday serve. When John was grown, he went to live in the wilderness, not some hugely populated area, living much like a hermit. Matter of fact, when we look at what he ate, he ate locusts and honey. 
Yet Luke says he will be great in the sight of the Lord. All of a sudden, many of us in here can relate to John the Baptist. Many of us have lived our lives in our own wilderness. We didn't have much. We came from modest means or little means. Are you in here with me? A lot of us didn't have much in our lives. A lot of us don't have much now. But God used John the Baptist to do great things for the kingdom of God. And I believe that God can use every single person in here to do great things for the kingdom of God. So we're going to dive into this. Yes, amen. I believe that, right? Now, last week, I had not one, not two, but probably 10 people tell me that my face changed colors as I was preaching. I was getting a little worked up. And I don't plan to go there today unless the Holy Spirit takes me there. But I, what I want more than anything for each and every person in here to understand God's calling on their life and the message that God has given them and then use it for God's glory because why else are we here if we don't want to be used for God's glory? So I want to look at the calling here in verse 1. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. John was some, someone by who all earthly means shouldn't have been born. If we read just the account of the birth of John the Baptist, he was somebody who shouldn't have been born. And the Luke has a polite way in saying this about John's parents. They were well along in their years. Basically, he was saying that they were old people, past childbearing years. There, his mother was somebody who was barren and unable to have children. Elizabeth couldn't have children. And it reminds us that nothing, and I mean nothing, is impossible with a possible God, church. An angel appeared to Elizabeth. An angel appeared to John's father, Zechariah, and said, your son will have a calling on his life. He told him, your son's going to have a calling on his life. He will be used by God to turn the children of Israel to the Lord. He will be filled with the spirit of the Lord and turn hearts that will make them ready for the Lord. This is the calling that God had placed on John's life before he was even born. Matter of fact, God says in Luke 1, 15, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. Now, I'm not trying to get deep in theological terms of what it means about having the Holy Spirit before you were even born, but the fact of the matter is that God had his hand on John before he was even thought about. Do you know that God knew you before you were even in your mother's womb, that God has a purpose for you in your life before you were even born? born. God has a purpose and a calling for each and every person in here today. The question that we look at in here today is that you may have been out in the wilderness of your own life. Your, your, your life may have taken many twists and turns just to be here in the Beacon Theater worshiping Jesus this morning, but here you are, church. And I believe God has a calling on your life. You know, John's greatness, why he was great, was related to his calling. He was to be a herald for the Messiah, proclaiming, you better get yourself right because the king is on the way. Why was John not simply called John? Because that is name. Why was he called John the Baptist? Matter of fact, in the Greek, it goes baptizer. John was known as someone who baptized people. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty cool thing to be known for. You know what? When I, when, when I die, I don't want people to know me as Michael the Donut Man. I want people to know me as Michael, whatever God wants to fill in. I want people to know me as somebody who was faithful to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how did he get his name? Well, the next words say that he got it not from being a hermit in the wilderness. He got it from being a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do you know that while not all of us are called to be pastors, all of us are called to be preachers. 
all of us are called to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I love the words uh, where he adds, where he preached. He, he did in the wilderness of Judea. He didn't go where there were lots of people. He preached to whoever was around him at the time. And child of God, I don't care what wilderness you're in, where you live, where you're from, but wherever you are, preach Jesus wherever you are. Don't be afraid to preach Jesus in the wilderness of your life. Some people are saying, I've got to get my act together. I got to stop doing drugs. I got to stop doing this. No, look, you are saved in spite of yourself. Preach Jesus wherever you are in your life. Look, he had a message to preach. Because some of you were like, well, what am I going to preach? Maybe that's for preachers. That's for people who have gone through seminary. And we see the message that he preached here in verses 2 through 3. And it says, saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. I love the simplicity of John's message. We live in a day. Matter of fact, I was looking around because this is the beginning of January. And I think the beginning of January, we have all things new. So a bunch of churches, a bunch of churches are going around with these new sermon series. You got to have, you got to do something to draw people into church after all, right? You got to come up. And so I Googled these, so it must be true, all right? It says, these are some of the sermon series that are going on at the movies or dinner with Jesus. These are some of the cool sermon series that are being promoted to draw people into the church. But let's look what John preached in his verse two here. It says, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. That is not going to win the coolest sermon series of 8030 church. That's not going to be the thing. The crazy about it is, that's the same message that Jesus preached when he started his message and his ministry. Matthew 4, 17 says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. I was talking to our um, deacon nerd. Um, is that a good name to call you? Okay, thanks, Mike. I was talking to Mike, and he had just made a trip to the Billy Graham Library down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Mike grew up Catholic, so he didn't get exposed to a lot of Billy Graham teachings and preachings back then. So it was his first opportunity to go and see Billy Graham. And they have little snippets of, if you go there, they have little snippets of some of the messages he preached. And Mike told me, he goes, you know, one of the crazy things about it is his message was extremely simple. I don't care where he was, how big the crowd was, his, his message was the same thing. And do you know what his message was? If you ever listened to one of his sermons, repent because the kingdom is near. Listen to me, church. That's the message that John the Baptist preached. That's the message that Jesus preached. And that's the message that I won't keep on preaching as long as I have breath. Repent because the kingdom is near. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters in your life if you don't repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. There is nothing else that matters in this life, church. Nothing. So what does that mean? What does it mean to repent? We talked, we had, a, we had a sermon on that about two months ago. What does it mean to repent? It doesn't see what people think in America today. Repent means I'm sorry I got caught. I won't do that again. That's what we think repent means. It means that you realize what you are doing is not working. And you need a change in your life. You need to make a 180, not that's all that, you need to make a 180 in your life and turn from your life of sin and turn to Jesus. Repentance is not just a sorrow for your sin, but a sorrow that leads to a change of life, a change of desire, and a desire to follow Jesus. You want to please God and not the flesh. Why is that necessary? Why can't I go to church and do the things that I like to do and still worship Jesus? John says, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. You need to remove the roadblocks in your life. 
You need to remove the roadblocks in your life that are, that are preventing you from having a relationship with Jesus because God cannot be around sin. And if you have known sin in your life that you're not dealing with, it is affecting your relationship with God. And the fact of the matter is you are as close to God as you want to be, church. So people tell me, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel God. I don't close to God. Are you dealing with the sins in your life? Man, he confronted the Jewish re religious practices of the day. He presumed that they were good because they were God's children. They were, they were born into salvation. He said, you cannot walk with God if you are out of fellowship with God. They needed a change of their life. And I believe that most people in here today, matter of fact, all people in here today need a change in their life. They need to deal with the things in their life that are not honoring God. I believe the church has become so worldly because they have become spiritually blind. If you don't know Christ as Lord of your life in here today, I'm calling you to repent of your sins. We're going to have an invitation here in a little bit. I'm calling you today to repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. That doesn't mean that you're not going to do some of the things. It just means that you're going to be convicted of those things, and you want to do things in your life that honor God. If you're in here today and you know that you know that you know that you're saved, that you know Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, I'm asking you, deal with the things in your life that you know are affecting your relationship with him, church. It's a simple message, but it's one the church needs to consistently hear. And I don't care if there's only one person left in here. I'm going to continue to preach the same message that Jesus preached. Is that okay with you? So look, we have his, his calling, we have his message, but we see his fruit here. And I think this is so cool for us to hear. In verses 5 through 6, it says, Then people from Jer Jerusalem and, and all Judea and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. If we read what this guy was wearing, this camel hair wearing, locust in wild honey eating person, standing in the middle of the wilderness, telling people to repent because the kingdom is near. Matter of fact, if you saw that in Hopewell, we see it every day in Hopewell, don't we? I mean, I'm just being honest. We might not hear them say the words repent. But we see some weird ducks in Hotwell every day. What would you say about those people? Would you go on the other side of the street? I know Beacon Hill, we go to them. You know, we're like, hey, come to church. And some of you are here today. Thank you. I'm not trying to talk about you, but I am. All right, look. It's a simple message. All right, I'm just, you would think that you'd be locked up in a psych ward, right? You would think that those people need to be locked up. You would think that, at best, people would ignore them and go on their own way. Would you think? Like, if somebody was saying that message, wearing those clothes, eating, eating that type of diet, you would just go on your way and just say, oh, that's, that's another person in Hopewell. You wouldn't expect anyone to listen to him, would you? You, would, you wouldn't expect anyone to listen to him. Not, not only for a weird dude in the wilderness, but in churches today. So this is why these cool sermon series have come out. Because people have wrongly assumed that people don't want to hear or are tired of hearing the message that Jesus gave us. Repent because the kingdom is near. Surely this passage ends with John the Baptist being disregarded. Surely if you're new here and you've never read the, the story of John the Baptist, surely if he's in the wilderness wearing this type of attire, eating this type of, uh, of diet, that, that surely no no one listened to him, and they went on their own way. But quite the opposite happened. When you read the Word of God, and by the way, this is not some fable that we're talking about. This is the Word of God. And if the Word of God says it, you can bake on it, church. And we read the Word of God. People were coming in droves, coming out of the woodwork from this weird dude preaching this simple message to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. 
They were coming from Jerusalem. They were coming from Judea, and they were coming from all around the Jerusalem. Now, look, they, they were going out to him. He wasn't going to them. They were going out to him. No social media, no flyers, no ad campaigns, just a simple message of repent because the kingdom is near. How can you explain something like this? How can you explain people coming to him dressed like he is and God drawing people to himself? You can explain it by saying only Jesus, only Jesus can do that, church. When God chooses to move in people, there's an enthusiasm and conviction that spreads throughout the hearts of many people. And this can only be explained by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then when you look at this, not only were they coming out to him, were they listening to this message, but they were confessing their sins. Think about this. Last time I preached this message on repentance, we had a powerful time where people came and, and they put their sins and we right there in a, in, a, in a bucket and we took it outside and we burned it so it was just between you and God. Remember that? It was a very powerful time and it spoke to me. But yet here in this text, we see people not just hiding their sins and confessing them. They were confessing them publicly, man. They were coming out from all the areas and they were confessing their sins. They're like, hey, I did this, I did this. And it's crazy to see that this was happening. And, and this, was, this was literally open, openly verbalizing the things that they were doing in their life that wasn't honoring God. And they didn't care. They didn't care what anyone thought. And you know what? When you come to Christ, you don't care about what other people think about you, only what God knows about you, church. You stop worrying about trying to keep up with the Joneses. You stop worrying about, oh my, I hope someone doesn't find out about this. Only thing you're worried about is pleasing and honoring and giving glory to God in your life. That's awesome. There's a member uh, in here. Um, I don't know where he's sitting right now, but, uh, and he doesn't even know I'm going to talk about him, but every time I, uh, and you don't have to stand up, but, but that's your cue to stand up. But uh, there's a member in here that every time I, I, I meet um, someone on the streets, I, I get him to tell the story about how he came to Christ. And he came to Christ um, by being in jail. And he was, he was literally, uh, there you go, bro, right there, right there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Took you long enough. I'll rebuke you in a little bit, all right? I'm just saying, man, all right, don't make me wait, don't make me sweat, like I'm going to, because there are other people that were in jail here too, like, man, I hope he's not talking about me, <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> but he, uh, he came to Christ, because um, he was in jail, and, uh, and when you first go to jail, um, those of you who've been there recently, or if you're going soon, you, um, you, uh, you get quarantined for like 10 days to make sure that you're not um, giving COVID around um, the jails, and so he was in there by himself 23 hours a day. Is that what it was? Something like that. And so somebody slipped uh, our daily um, bread underneath his um, jail cell. And, and he, didn't even, he didn't even know anything really about Jesus at that time, but he had nothing else to do for 23 hours a day. So he thought he read it, read it, and, and he came to Christ. And uh, when he came out, there was somebody else in our church who happened to be there, um, you know, because he was not visiting, you know, <laughs> residents, you know. And, um, and uh, they started a Bible study in jail. And, uh, and here's the crazy thing about it is, and I, and I want you, and I don't say that to embarrass him. I just want to say that about how God used you, how God used other people. And some of you here today, you're embarrassed about the things that you've done in your life. But I want you to know that God can use you in spite of yourself. So don't be embarrassed about what you've done. Matter of fact, God can use your past for his glory in the future. You hear me? Um, so you're, you're, uh, I'm sharing this message about repentance and, and coming to Christ. And, and you might not think like, man, that's, no one really wants to hear that, you know, because we think about this crazy people holding up repent signs. But Kim and I took this um, class up in Northern Virginia, and we learned uh, this thing called the three circles. And we went through this whole class, and uh, then, then we had to go out and actually, you know, it's one thing to learn about Jesus, another thing to tell people about Jesus. So we had to go out to a parking lot, and we're like, this is not going to work. Because basically, you're telling people that you need to repent and trust Jesus. That's really what three circles is. It's a simple, simplified form of like, okay, here you go. You suck. This is Jesus. You need to repent and turn your life to Jesus. 
And so we went to um, a shopping center. The first person goes, I'm, I'm saved. I don't need any of that Jesus stuff. Okay, yes, you do, but that's another story, all right? And, but the second person we came to, they turned their life over to Christ. And you know what they did? They said, hey, my relative is on the way picking me up. Can you wait around and share this with him as well? Because I've never heard it before in my life. And this reminds us, what is important is that the message is important, not the messenger. The message you have is simple. Repent and turn your life to Christ because the kingdom is near. You can't screw it up, church, if God's in it. Do you hear me? Allow the Holy Spirit to use you. So look, here's the challenges for this in verses 7 through 12. And I won't read all those verses. You can read them for yourself. Hopefully your Bibles are open. A whole other sermon can be written about these verses. And the crowd of people coming to be baptized were these Pharisees and these Sadducees. These were people who thought their religious or their birth had made them right with God. But it, but it figured it wouldn't hurt to be baptized as well. So John calls them up. You imagine like, you know, we've had some days where we've had like 10 people baptized or something like that. You imagine like, Okay, this person get baptized, you get person, and then I just stopped and said, you brood of viper, get out of here. That'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? You know, y'all would say, man, pastor didn't lost his freaking mind again, needs another donut or something, all right? But this is what he did. That's what he did. On the surface, that would seem to be judgmental, but these were people that were easy to spot. The crazy thing about this is, is there are a lot of people in church pews today that, are, that aren't easy to spot. They believe they're right with God, but their hearts are far from God. Those who have truly repented of their sins and trusted Jesus as Lord of their lives. John says there's a test to see. John says there's a test to see if those people are sincere about the repentance. If people come and say they repented of their sins and follow through with baptism, but never change their lives, all they did was get wet, church. There must be a change in your life. Some are small. Some are huge, but there must be a change. Change lives proves repentance. John continues on by saying, look, you can tell me all you want that you've changed. I'm not your judge. And when we read through the the rest of the verses, John says, look, I'm telling you the message. I'm not your judge. I'm not the one that decides whether or not you go to heaven or hell. All I am here is a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ because there is someone who is coming that you cannot fool with your lips because he sees your heart. And his name is Jesus. He is going to come with a winnowing fork, and he is going to separate. It's not going to be people in the church like, oh, I came to church every day. I serve the church. He's like, look, I know your hearts, and you didn't truly repent, and you're going to heaven, and you're going to hell. He's going to know the difference between the two. You can't fool Jesus, church. Are you serious about repenting of your sins and trusting Christ? Because this is what it talks about. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the invitation, but this is the last part. I want to talk about what made John great. Because some of us, when we talked about it, you know, he must have been popular, he must have had a great family, he must have had a lot of money, and we see that's not true. But if you don't have a copy of the sermon, jot these things down about what defined his greatness. One I actually didn't put in here. Um, He was filled and controlled by the Spirit. You want to be great? You want to do great things for God? You want to do great things for the kingdom of God? Learn to be led and filled by the Holy Spirit. You can do nothing without God, but you can do anything with God, church. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. He was obedient to God's word. When I tell people to do quiet time, they think I'm like making them do schoolwork. Like, oh, I did my quiet, oh, I didn't do as much as I looked. You are, as I said before, you are as close to God as you want to be. If you read the Word of God, then you've got to do something with the Word of God. You've got to be obedient to what God is calling you to do. Thirdly, what made John great is he was humble. He's like, look, you're coming out to me, but look, the one that is coming after me, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals, and his name is Jesus. Look, it doesn't matter if anyone ever knows your name as long as they know his name, and his name is Jesus Christ. We're not here to make our names great. We're here to make the name of Jesus Christ great. We're not here to make the name of Beacon Hill great. We're here to make Jesus' name great. Are you with me this morning? He was humble. He was courageous. Uh, Sierra 
I'm going to call you out a little bit. I threw you out on, underneath the uh, comfort bus on Friday, didn't I? You know, Sierra comes, and she's been, she started off just coming and picking up some food and, and going and serving some people. And then she started, as the Holy Spirit started getting a hold of her, and this, thing, this, is, this is just Holy Spirit right now, all right? And then you started helping with the unsheltered. Then you started serving. So she comes, and it's one of her favorite things to do, serving on Free Food Friday. So we had a lot of help on Friday, and I said, hey, Sierra, guess what? You're going to go um, Thomas Roth, and you're going to knock on doors and tell people about Jesus and hand out food. So go. I didn't give her a chance to say no. But she did, and she ended up, um, I, got a, I just shared with her a text I got from, from the boys that, um, that we, we messaged. And uh, they said, you know, Sierra was so great because we went into a drug dealer's house. We didn't go inside, Mom, all right? We didn't go inside, all right? Just to, that's next week. The, um, <laughs> but she, she stood um, right there with a couple of other guys, and they invited the drug dealer to church. And I don't know, you made an excuse or whatever, and you said, it doesn't matter what you wear, just come as you are. You know, that's just somebody who's making themselves available to be used by God. And God is using her to do great things for the kingdom of God. It takes courageous people, and it takes faithful people. It takes faithful people who are saying, look, when I talked about last week, and I got kind of crazy at this point in time, when I talked about um, what my heart and my desire is for Five Forks and for the city of Hopewell. You know, there's been a shooting the last two nights. And I look at what my heart and my desire for. I need faithful people who are obedient, who want to change this city for the glory of God. Is that you? I mean, because I, I, I'm sitting here, we're six years into this. I'm going to ask Rob to come up, the prayer team to come up. We're six years into this. And I believe God has called us to do extraordinarily more than we could ever think or ask, more than we've seen in the first six years. I believe God is going to do way more. And this isn't some prosperity preach. I believe that if you are committed to do great things for God and you put your yes on the table, I believe God is going to do abundantly more than we could ever think or ask here in the well this year. Are you, do you believe that? Four people believe that, Rob. How do you think that? You came from New Bern, North Carolina, for four people to believe that they can be used to do great things for God. Do you believe that, Rob? I want to say uh, he's our only shot at greatness, y'all. He's it. You take it from here. God, God, God is good. He's our only shot, y'all. He's the shot we have at greatness. Do you understand what that means, church? I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it means. You can't go to the place that my mom and dad brought me home from the hospital to right now. You can't go there. It's underwater. It's under six feet of water right now as we speak. The land that is left there they built a hotel parking lot over top of. When I say he's our only shot, I mean it. I had no place. I had no right. And yet he called me. Look, we expect God to do the big things, right? We expect him to end the wars and to bend the bow and break the spear, as Psalm 46 says. But you know how I know he's God? He stills my heart. No one else can do that. Has he stilled your heart this morning, church? He's our shot at greatness. And it's for his name and for his glory.